We are going to continue in our series on faith and hope and love. The, uh, the only thing that matters is God's love. And the only actions God's love in us given for others is the only action that matters. God's love for us is the only thing that matters. And God's love in us given for others, that's the only action that matters. And that's the whole sermon. But because we've spent roughly 6,000 minutes since we were last together to hear a word from God in this place, and who knows how many of those are actually devoted to wholeheartedly receiving God's love and giving God's love to others, we'll just take a few more minutes to reflect here together. And I pray that you'll be reminded how much God loves you. And I pray that this reflection will somehow make a difference in how we're able to love each other. So let's hear from uh, the first of three letters that the Apostle John wrote, reading from 1 John 4, 7 through 12. I turned the numbers around on our sermon slide. It says 7 to 21. It should be 7 to 12. So 1 John 4, 7 to 12, if you want to pull that up on your devices or on any Bibles that you brought. Here's what John writes, and I'm going to be reading from the message translation. So if you're looking at your own translation, you'll get a chance to hear this from uh, Eugene Peterson, who was a lifelong Presbyterian pastor, devoted, who went to be with the Lord a few years ago. And he translated, gave a translation of the Bible called The Message. Let me read to you from The Message. My beloved friends, let us continue to love each other since love comes from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and experiences a relationship with God. The person who refuses to love doesn't know the first thing about God because God is love. And so you can't know him if you don't love. This is how God showed his love for us. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. This is the kind of love we are talking about. Not that we once upon a time loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to clear away our sins and the damage they've done to our relationship with God. My dear, dear friends, if God loved us like this, we certainly ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, ever. But if we love one another, God dwells deeply within us and his love becomes complete in us. Perfect love. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for the height, the depth, the breadth, and the width of your perfect and complete love for us. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, coming out of this pandemic feels a lot like a reboot in our life programming. And we've been reflecting in this sermon and the previous two sermons on these three classic Christian virtues, these three classic Christian characteristics, faith, hope, and love as a way to orient and re-engage as we emerge in in what life looks like on this side of the pandemic. As the Apostle Paul wrote, the greatest of these three is, of course, the love. There we go. Jesus' youngest disciple, John, is in love with God's love. His gospel holds that saying, which is arguably the centerpiece of the entire big story, that God so loved the world that he sent his own, you know it, his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not die, but have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world may be saved through him. And John's gospel tells stories about love that the other gospel writers did not include. You can probably think of some of these. Maybe you remember um, Jesus kneeling to wash his disciples' feet as an act of love and a demonstration of love when he gave what he said was his greatest command, 
to love one another as I have loved you. By this, the whole world, Jesus said, will know you are my disciples, how you love each other. This comes in John's gospel. John's gospel gives us the story of Peter on the beach with Jesus after Jesus has been raised from the dead and Jesus giving an opportunity for Peter to replace his threefold denial with three professions of love. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? John writes the letter we're considering this morning and this week to testify to God's love in Jesus Christ. And it starts out like this in 1 John. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testified to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. John likes this word complete or perfect in his letter. It's the word teleos. It's, it's that word family. And it doesn't mean without fault. What it means is it's finished. It's complete. It's, it's come to its desired or its intended end, right? So in this way, every single dinner that David makes for me is perfect. Because it's complete. It's come to its desired end. It's in front of me. That was the goal, right? That's what telios is. So I would encourage you in your marriages, your families, and your friendships to focus more on telos perfection than blameless perfection. It's going to help a lot. But keep that in mind when you're hearing perfect or complete. That's what John's talking about, the end for which it was intended. John goes on to write in this letter about sin and forgiveness, that if anyone claims to be without sin, they are deceiving themselves and the truth is not in them. But if anyone confesses their sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive them and cleanse them of all unrighteousness. That comes from this letter, 1 John. John writes about how loving means keeping Jesus' command to love a brother or a sister, how hating a brother or a sister is living in the dark rather than living in the light. John warns against loving this world and the things of this world because this world and its desires pass away, he says. But God's way gives eternal life and anyone who does not love remains in death. And then we come to the passage for today. And this is the passage we're going to reflect on. Oh, no, we don't. First, we come to another really important two verses before the passage for today. And I love the fact that this 1 John 3.16 is almost like an expansion of John 3.16, where he writes, this is how we've come to understand and experience love. Christ sacrificed his life for us. This is why we ought to live sacrificially for our fellow believers and not just be out for ourselves. This is the message again, by the way. If you see some brother or sister in need and have the means to do something, but turn a cold shoulder and do nothing, what happens to God's love? It disappears. And you made it disappear. My dear children, let's not just talk about love. Let's practice real love. This is the only way we'll know we're living truly, living in God's reality. It's also the way to shut down debilitating self-criticism. Even when there's something to it. For God is greater than our worried hearts and knows more about us than we do ourselves. See, according to the elder John, the disciple John, John, remember, who can tell you the color of Jesus' eyes, and whether or not he woke up happy or grumpy. John, who stood at the cross keeping vigil as Jesus suffered and took into his home at Jesus' uh, invitation and command, Jesus' mother. John, who sat there eating breakfast with Jesus on a beach after Jesus rose from the dead. John testifies 
to God's love in Jesus Christ. This, he says, this is what you've got to know. This is the most important thing you have got to know, is this love of God in Jesus Christ. It's the only source of eternal life. It's the only source of life here and now, real life. So I wonder how beloved you're feeling emerging from this pandemic. How's, how's, how's love going in your relationships? How's love going in the church, for heaven's sakes, in, in, in our uh, Christian witness in the States over the last 18 months of this pandemic? We've taken some hits. John's letter, actually, um, it's, it's, it's um, supposed, and I think this is true, that it was written to some congregations that have re recently uh, split, they divided, they'd had conflict, and they needed this letter about uh, the testimony of Jesus Christ that John had seen and about love. So emerging from this pandemic, let's, there's, two, there's two things that I want to really um, expand out and unpack from verses 7 to 12 of chapter 4 for all of us. Um, as we live into this reality that God's love for us is the only thing that matters and God's live, love in us that's given for others, that's the only act that matters. Here's the first thing. When it comes to love, you have to start from the source. You have to start from the source. And according to John in 4.7, the source of that love is God. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. This is now the, um, the NIV. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. My grandmother is um, knocking on the door of 99 years old on July 10th. And she and Grandpa, they, they were married. Their whole married lives got married when Grandma was 18, I believe. And boy, that was not an um, easy marriage. Uh, it's, it's kind of, we know this in the family. And my grandma tells a story, told a story, about how she was standing in the living room at their, you know, the tiny living room in their house in Spokane. Grandpa was a railroad engineer after being a fireman, railroad fireman. And um, he was taking a nap on the couch, you know, post his shift. And she said she was just standing in that doorway hating him and uh, not wanting to be, not knowing how she could be married to this man anymore. And grandma was not religious. She sent her three oldest kids, my mom being one of them, to the Lutheran church on Sunday mornings or Sunday school so she could have some peace and quiet. Uh, but she stood in that doorway, hate my grandfather, and she says, God spoke to me, I heard a voice, and the voice said, if I can love him, you can love him. That, the source. The source changed everything. Love comes from God, John writes. Many years ago now, has anybody else done the spiritual exercises in everyday life, the nine-month Ignatian Jesuit uh, practice of spiritual exercises in everyday life. Many of you have done spiritual practices. The spiritual exercises is based on a 30-day Jesuit retreat that, um, that goes through um, to draw deeper into uh, God's love and Jesus' love. And there's four exercises that one goes through. And um, what we would do on this nine-month retreat is commit to an hour of prayer a day, and meeting with a spiritual director, and meeting once a month with a cohort around this to follow through these four movements, these four exercises of uh, prayer and reflection. And the first week of the exercise was a time of reflection in light of God's boundless love for us. That was the starting place. I wasn't used to that starting place. The starting places I'm used to is in light, for example, of God as creator, or in light of, of, you know, we start with our need for God and our sins and where we have failed and the fact that we need God. But the Ignatian exercises start in light of God's boundless love. Everything has to start with God's love. Everything starts with God's love. A time of reflection on, in light of God's boundless love for us, discovering that our response to God's love has been hindered by patterns of sin. We start with the source of God's love. That, you know, that changed everything in my own understanding of who God is, 
my own walk following Jesus Christ, my own self-condemnation when all I could see was the things that hinder my love for God, is to start at the source, to start with God's boundless love for you. Beginning with the source of the solution, the height and the depth and the breadth and the width of God's love. Here's the thing we do. This is what we do in the world. When there's a problem, you look for the source of the problem, don't you? That's what we do. And it's usually the other person. <laughs> when there's a problem, we look for the source of the problem. What John says is when there's a problem, look for the source of the solution. And the solution is the boundless love of God in Jesus Christ. That's the solution. This week, as you're hitting issues, as you're hitting problems with other people in our society, in your work, and your first instinct will be who or what is the source of this problem. Start with the source of the solution. Start with the source of the solution. Start with the boundless love of God in Jesus Christ. This really is the only way to follow Jesus' command to love and to love without judgment. To love without judgment. When we start with the boundless love of God in Jesus Christ and see this love that is so marvelous and so wonderful and has covered all of our sins, how do we stand in judgment on somebody else? It changes everything. I wonder how hungry and thirsty you are right now for the love of God in Jesus Christ. I wonder how much of your day each day is positioned on receiving God's love in Jesus Christ, not performing for God, not learning of God, not bringing things to God, but starts with receiving the love of God in Jesus Christ. Through scriptures, through prayer, through contemplation. And just to clarify the source of God's love that we start with, John goes on to the next verse. And he says this. By the way, if you guys are getting warm on this side, you can open a couple of those windows. Not that any of you needed to know that. You can open windows in your house too. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son. This is, this is appropriate for Father's Day. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. It all starts with God. There's a source in the starting place. It all starts with God's love. But that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. The demonstration, the full demonstration of God's love, John says, is Jesus in the world. It all comes back to this. The purpose of God's love in this big story that we've talked about is that the entire cosmos, the entire universe is set right, is rescued from the bondage of sin, and it's the cross of Jesus Christ, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ that sets everything right. That's love. And this love starts with God, not with us. It starts with God making a way by sending his son as an atoning sacrifice. What does that mean? Atoning sacrifice. Think in your head right now. If somebody who um, uh, has no, no experience with the Christian faith at all said to you, what do you mean atoning sacrifice? I'm going to give you 15 seconds in your head to come up with what you would say to that one. What is it? What do you mean atoning sacrifice? At one is good, Scott. Yeah, that atonement, you see at one in there, to make it one again, to make it unified again. It's interesting the way that, um, uh, I love the way Peterson translated this. It's why I wanted to read to you out of the message. Um, sent his only son. And then Peterson says, he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to clear our way our sins and the damage they'd done. We spoke last week about hope. We spoke about this inheritance laid up in heaven. We spoke about how it's imperishable and incorruptible and it's unfading. And think about how much of human desire, how much of our desires and the desires of those around us is to be, um, is to be healthy and whole, to, to not be damaged and have dignity. 
to be unfading, undiminished. And we live in this world of decay. We live in the world, amidst of a world of everything that defeats and damages and diminishes. And those things that defeat and damage and diminish, they just create these barriers. They create these, these uh, uh, hindrances to, to loving God fully, to loving one another fully, to people flourishing in the life that God intended to give. And I want you to notice that First John says, the first verse 8 or 9, verse 9, talks about God sent his son so we might live through him. And verse 10 is an atoning sacrifice. So the purpose and the goal is life. The purpose and the goal is life. And in order to get there, in order to remove these barriers, these hindrances, the destruction and the, the defeat and, and, and the diminishment that sin creates, those barriers, those hindrances have to be removed. Atonement is the removing of those barriers. Atonement is getting that out of the way so that God's love can be freely received and God's love in us can be freely given to other people. All that defeats our best efforts to preserve and protect life, all that destroys human life and relationships, all that diminishes the dignity of the image of God in the other, all of this traces back to sin. And sin in the big story is both a power that has to be overcome and the consequence of choices of people who live under that power. And what we want, what we seek individually as a people is life undefeated and undamaged and undiminished. That's what we want. And that's what God wants for God's people. And so to receive this, the defeating and the damaging and the diminishing powers of sin, the, def the, the defeat and the damage and the diminishment that is the detritus, the after effects, the, the result of, this, of us participating with those powers of sins, that has to be cleared away, that has to be taken care of. And that's what atonement does. Jesus' death on the cross, his willing self-sacrifice, abolishes both the power and the consequence of sin. Jesus' death abolishes both the power of sin and the consequences of sin. It's the absolute and tangible demonstration of God's love. Now remember I said first, instead of going to the source of the problem, you've gotta to go to the source of the solution. And then once you know, we go to that source of the solution, we seek God's love, we seek to re receive God's love in our lives, and then we, we seek to turn around and to give that love how do we do it without being under the power of sin? How do, how do we live out that love without, uh, and get through the damages that sin has created, the real barriers and hindrances of the sinful human choices that have resulted in damage for other people, the diminishment of the glory of, of the image of God in people, the, the decay or the death that we see around? Well, that's where the second part of an atoning sacrifice is so important because what we see in Jesus is instead of taking all the power that he had to go head on with everything that damages, everything that defeats, everything that diminishes, instead of power against those things, Jesus took all of his love and his, all of his power toward the people who were damaged and defeated and diminished. That's the turn that love makes. That's the turn of the cross. Instead of going head to head with a power that he could have defeated, but not without taking a lot of people with him. Instead of power against, love turns power toward the defeated and the damaged and the diminished. It's here where God sends Jesus as an atoning Sacrifice. That's what sacrificial love, sacrificial love, the way that the love that leads to light and life. Once we've identified the problem we want to see solved, our first instinct is always put all our energy into the problem, into the power that's causing that problem, into the source of that problem. And people become a problem. And what Jesus does is he says, you come back to the source of love. And when Jesus Christ said on the cross, it is is finished. It means that these powers have already been defeated. The hindrances and barriers created by them, they're going to fall. They're not going to last. They cannot last. 
there is a final victory. So Jesus says to us in the church, you people, you who follow me, focus your love for the defeated and the damaged and the diminished. And out of love for them, yeah, you'll find yourself being encountered by all these powers. And yes, you'll hit these barriers. And yes, they'll have to be engaged with. But keep your focus here. Use your power for, not against. The question shifts from how can I win this or how can I change this to who? Who's losing because of this? Who can I love in this? Who can I serve in this? What does love demand? See, we live in a story of problem, solution, and I love solving problems. Anybody who works with me on session, anyone who works with me on staff knows that this is, I'll tell you why I didn't want to preach this sermon. I was in the worst mood with David this morning. How many times did I snap at you? Could you put it on two hands? I think you probably could. I, this is, if there's one place, no, nah, it's more than one. This is one of those places <laughs> that as a human person trying to follow Jesus Christ, I just struggle because I grew up in this world. And I look for the source of the problem and what needs to be changed to fix this problem. That's our instinct, immediately. And Jesus says, back up, girlfriend. Look to God, who is the source of love, and who do you need to love? Because then you'll still hit those other things, but without judgment, without destroying people, without impatience. This is the challenge. We live in a world of problem, solution, and we're grateful for people who diagnose and see the problems and tell the truth about the problems. But without love, as Paul says, it comes to nothing. I'll tell you where this really came home to me. This, um, this uh, last winter, actually, does anybody else, um, did anybody else see this article in The Atlantic? It was in December of 2020. We have family friends with a, with a Down syndrome uh, boy, Emmett, and, and she's constantly posting pictures and videos of Emmett online, and he's just the cutest kid you've ever seen. Uh, but this, this article in The Atlantic says, the last children of Down syndrome. Prenatal testing is changing who gets born and who doesn't. And this is just the beginning. It's an excellent article. The author starts out uh, in Denmark, and the reason she focuses on Denmark is because in 2004, uh, in Denmark, the guidelines changed, and so every woman receives genetic prenatal testing, screening for Down syndrome. And since then, 96% um, of the time, when a result comes back that the unborn child will have Down syndrome, the child is aborted. So in 2019, there were only 18 children born in uh, Denmark who had Down syndrome, and um, only seven of them had been uh, screened and, and caught through prenatal testing. And so what the article is really about is both this, it's about this sort of, um, um, uh, it's, it's, it, it's about um, uh, the clash, uh, designer is the, is, the, is the dismissive way of saying it, um, screening in terms of children and children in the womb. Most parents who test, um, let's be clear, are really seeking to help and not hinder their children. There are diseases, there are conditions that are caught in screening ahead of time that are, um, and for example, Tay-Sachs syndrome is a success story of this. They can catch it. It's a syndrome that can be caught through prenatal screening uh, genetically and can be addressed and prevented. But Down syndrome is called the canary in the coal mine for selective reproduction. That's the word I was looking for, selective reproduction. She writes, it was one of the first genetic conditions to be routinely screened for in utero, and it remains the most troubling because it is among the least severe. It is very much compatible with life, even a long, happy life. Close quote. And then at one point in this article, I'd commend it to you. It's an excellent article if you, if you can't find it. I don't know if the Atlantic's behind a paywall, but I'll send you a PDF of it. Just let me know. I hope no one from the Atlantic is watching this. At some, at near the end of the article, though, she, talks, she tells a story that uh, Stephanie Meredith, who's the director of the National Center for Prenatal and Postnatal Resources at the University of Kentucky, 
told her story. And the story was about uh, um, uh, Dr. Meredith, Ms. Meredith has two children, uh, and one's a 20-year-old son, and he was watching his sister play basketball. And on the court, there was a very bad collision, and she went down, and, and her head just cracked on the floor. Everybody could hear it. And everybody else froze except that 20, her 20-year-old brother. And her brother just leapt out of the stands. And the way his mom describes it, he wasn't worried about the rules. He wasn't worried about decorum. He was just responding and taking care of her, Meredith told me. She had recently been asked a simple but probing question. What was she most proud of about her son that was not an achievement or a milestone? The incident on the basketball court was one that came to mind. It doesn't have to do with accomplishment, she said. It has to do with caring about another human being. That question had stayed with Meredith, and it stayed with me because of how subtly yet powerfully it reframes what parents should value in their children. Dads, you've got to tell your kids today that you're proud of them. You need to tell your kids every day that you love them. How subtly and powerfully it reframes what parents should value in their children, not grades or basketball trophies since, or college acceptance letters or any of the things parents usually brag on. By doing so, it opens the door to a world less obsessed with achievement. Meredith pointed out that Down syndrome is defined and diagnosed by a medical system made up of people who have to be highly successful to get there, who likely base part of their identity on their intelligence. This is the system giving parents the tools to decide what kind of children to have. Might it be biased on the question of whose lives have value? As she wraps up this article, the author writes, I've wondered why so often, we need so often to point to, to, point to achievements for evidence that the lives of people with Down syndrome are meaningful. She describes how uh, at the very end, the very last paragraph of this article describes her sitting there with the mother and the Down syndrome child that she has been interviewing. And uh, Carl Emil has grown bored while we talked in English. They were talking in, in, in English rather than Danish, his mother tongue. He tugged at Greet's hair and smiled sheepishly to remind us that he was still there, that the stakes of our conversation were very real and very human. Here is where hope and love and faith are so essential together. Because in a world where our power and our options are limited, there are things we can't fix, there are things we cannot change, there are things we cannot do. We, there are a limited number of options that are seen as open to people. And one of those you know, options is simply prevention and stopping. In this case, not even prevention. It's beyond that. Now, I want to be very clear that if you are a woman who's listening to this sermon and you have had an abortion, or you are a partner, a, a husband, who has been with someone and they have had uh, an abortion, that there is no condemnation in Jesus Christ. That who here can condemn? No one except Jesus Christ. And he has died for us, died for our sins, and is advocating on the side of the Father. So I am not bringing this up to shame anyone. But I am bringing it up to show what a closed box and a closed system the problem solving that our world can do is. Because without the hope of the imperishable, the incorruptible, the unfading, this is where we go as a society. But with the hope of the imperishable, the incorruptible, the unfading, then love and faith in that makes all the difference. Love engages. People are not problems to be solved or issues to be addressed. There are problems to solve and issues to address, but here's the good news. God is the source of all love. He sent his only beloved son as an atoning sacrifice whose death on the cross has defeated the powers of sin and death. He has abolished the powers of sin that diminish or destroy or defeat. And we are called to testify to that truth in the way that we love. We're called to be a community that welcomes and embraces kids because they are loved by God and created in God's image, not how they perform or what they can contribute back. You are loved by God. 
and created in God's image, not because of how you perform or what you contribute back. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice. So faith looks at a suffering savior and believes at the end of the story that suffering is not meaningless because suffering gives opportunity for love. And hope looks at the promise of the imperishable and the incorruptible and the unfading and acts in the reality that that inheritance is given here and now in part by the Holy Spirit. And so we can love and it is not wasted. And love begins with God as a source of love and acts in faith and hope to love others from this source. Not that people are perfect or societies can be perfected, but that the purpose of God's love can be achieved. And that is that we love each other. Let's pray. Lord God, the world will say that all we need is love and that love wins, and the world is right. And we confess that you are the source of love. The love that we need doesn't come from this world and cannot come from this world. We confess and declare in our prayers before you that the victory of love will not be generated in our actions. It radiates out from the willing sacrifice of you for us on the cross. So thank you for removing the sinful barriers. Thank you for removing the barriers of defeat and destruction and diminished glory that are the results of sin. Thank you for pouring out the love that we need. And we ask this week, Lord Jesus, that you give us the, the courage and the capacity to pivot. We pray you help us to pivot from going to the source of the problem and start with you as a source and solution. In this moment, Lord, in, these, uh, in this silence, we sit in your presence. We ask you to forgive our sins and to give us the grace of your abundant love. Lord, we pray for the grace this week to pivot from directing power against to directing our love and our power for others who we can serve. Would you please surround and immerse our deep desire for justice in love? Would you please surround and immerse our deep desire for vindication in love? Would you please surround and immerse our deep desire to succeed to do well, to excel, to glorify you in our work and our ways. Surround it in love. Would you please surround our family relationships, our friendships, our work relationships in love? Would you please give us the grace to ask first in every situation, who do I love? And then ask you what we should do. And God, in your great love, we bring you those things we are too small to fix. We bring you the cry for justice. We bring you the cry for peace. We bring you the cry for housing and for food and for shelter. We bring you the, the cry for meaningful work, for good work to do. And we ask for the patience and the courage to, uh, to watch where you send us in joining you in your victory. Lord, please bless families and children as they've wrapped up school and they're getting ready to travel. Please bless our teachers who are taking a well-needed deep breath as they wrap up everything from the school year. Please, uh, please bless and encourage those who are sick and those who are loving those who are sick. We pray for your healing. And for us as a church, Jesus, 
Would you please work among us powerfully and consistently and patiently until we become known to our neighbors as a church that loves at all costs and even at great costs those around us. Thank you for the promise of your kingdom and we pray into that kingdom when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.